Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Microbial Minutes, where we are going to discuss what the hot things are in the microbial sciences. I'm Julie Wolf, uh, here for our only update in September. So we normally do this every two weeks, but it's been three weeks because of Labor Day last weekend, and I am busy in the next two weeks, so we'll do the next one in October. However, that means that there's only that much more microbial sciences for us to cover, so we're going to jump right in. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the slides uh, and the figures that I'm referring to, but don't forget that if you want to leave a question or make a comment during the presentation, feel free to type something in and we will be able to address that during the presentation. Okay, let's see here. Okay, oops. So we are uh, in microbial minutes and we are going to discuss what important things have happened in the microbial sciences. We're going to talk about a number of different aspects of things that have happened in the last three weeks. Today we are going to discuss how archaeal vesicles mediate virus-like plasmid transfer. We will talk about fish meal, uh, what it is, and how it contains and increases the number of antimicrobial resistance genes. We will talk about how the U.S. antibiotic prescription fill rate uh, has been declining, as well as difficulty in predicting polymyxin susceptibility. Uh, finally, we'll end on a story about the seasonality of microbiomes in a hunter-gatherer society. So we are going to discuss these papers, um, which are listed here from a variety of different sources. These will be linked as well as some of the um, articles that I reference below the show after the, um, after the presentation is over. Moving on, we're going to jump right in with a paper from Nature Microbiology. This paper is titled, A Plasmid from an Antarctic Haloarchaean Uses Specialized Membrane Vesicles to Disseminate and Infect Plasmid-Free Cells. The take-home message from this uh, study is that archaeal vesicles mediate virus-like plasmid transfer. So we'll be talking about the transfer of several types of DNA. Um, extra chromosomal DNA within archaeal cells. Archaeal cells, like um, bacteria, are single-celled organisms that do not have a nucleus, but they do have a genome as well as several extra chromosomal DNA um, encoding mechanisms. Some of those are transmitted by viruses, um, such as archaeophage, uh, and some of those are mediated by plasmids. Plasmids are small circular pieces of DNA that normally have accessory genes that are not um, required as part of the genomic content, the, the main genomic program within the chromosomal DNA. So how does the transfer between the viral and plasma DNA differ? One can consider the way that DNA is protected. Within a phage, that DNA is put into a protein structure that can then um, protect the DNA from any exposure. Whereas plasmid DNA is not always protected um, in a very structured way as it is transferred between cells. However, um, plasmids, when they are transferred between cells, often will require a cell-to-cell -cell contact for that horizontal gene transfer to occur um, through such um, apparatus as a pillus through which that plasmid can then be transferred from the first cell into the second cell. Whereas um, phage and other types of viruses are generally uh, free of a cell-to-cell -cell contact requirement. And so the researchers in this uh, article wanted to ask about the relationship between the transfer of viral and plasmid DNA. Specifically, they were asking, could viruses have emerged from plasmids by hijacking host mechanisms? And to look at this, to investigate this, they were using an archaeal study um, species called Halorubrum lacus profundii strain RS or R1S1. So the life cycle of a plasmid that they are studying is shown here on the right-hand side. Let me put on the pen. You can see here a plasmid that are called PR1SE, or as I read it uh, as, the, as the article was going on, prize. Uh, and so as this plasmid is um, being translated and transcribed into um, protein products, those protein products are then incorporated into the host uh, membrane. And those um, integral membrane products, along with several that are encoded in the host genome, 
are incorporated into a vesicle, a lipid vesicle that incorporates the plasmid as well. This is called a plasmid vesicle by the researchers. And this vesicle that contains the plasmid can then be released from the host cell um, and then eventually reach a second un um, non-plasmid containing cell where the vesicle can interact with that host membrane and release the plasmid into the um, cytoplasm of that cell. From this point, you can start again so that the, um, the genes from that plasmid can be transcribed and translated into that protein products, or that plasmid can actually integrate um, into the host genome as shown here. Here, the cell can divide and pass that plasmid DNA onto its progeny, um, as indicated here, and the cell can actually have the, the plasmid excise from the, from the genome. Um, in, in this case, it's called a P rise derivative, meaning that it has actually taken some of the DNA from, um, from the host genome in addition to that plasmid DNA. So in looking at the different um, data that they, uh, that they generate during this um, study, there are several pieces of data that uh, indicate that this P rise is a plasmid or a virus. Here, um, on the side of it being a plasmid, there are no virus-specific genes. So none of the genes that they identify have similarity to other known archaeal viruses. Now, of course, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, um, but the plasmid does contain plasmid genes um, that are typical of other archaeal plasmids, suggesting that this is potentially a plasmid. Uh, and they also say that the capacity to incorporate long stretches of host DNA is something else that is characteristic of a plasmid, although we also know that this is something that other types of um, bacteriophage in, in particular can also do to incorporate stretches of the host genomic DNA along with the plasmid DNA. Uh, here, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side is the first figure from the paper where you're looking at an archaeal cell in panel A uh, and several of the vesicles that have been purified away from the cells in panel B and C. Uh, and in panel A, you see a number of these vesicles that are being generated, um, some of which may have the plasmid inside of them. On the side of the P. rise being a virus, the authors say that this DNA transfer via infection um, is very viral-like. So these plasmids um, inside of the vesicles are released away from the cell, very similar to how a bacteriophage progeny would be released away from the cell, where it can then interact with um, a very disparate or far away uh, secondary host. Uh, they also, the authors also say that the structured packaging using the plasmid encoded proteins plus the host proteins is um, very similar to the way that lots of viruses um, interact with the extra with when they are building that extracellular um, or uh, when they are building that that membrane vesicle. And so what the authors conclude is that the discovery of this P rise therefore provides a precedent for how viruses might have emerged from plasmid like extracellular um, extra chromosomal elements by acquiring a mechanism that enables their dissemination between host cells that is independent of cell to cell contact. Uh, and so this is just a really cool basic uh, science study looking at how DNA moves around from between different types of cells. Uh, and I'm not the only one who thought this. There were a number of microbial scientists who were sharing this on um, social media. Here's one um, scientist who is saying that this is amazing, an archaeal plasmid that builds its own membrane then migrates to infect new cells with a response saying, is it a pleomorphic virus or a plasmid? Uh, and yet somebody else saying, oh, this is something between a plasmid and a virus. Uh, and so this is really cool, um, very basic uh, science, but uh, as I said, it's a kind of a hybrid between the, the plasmid and the viral transfer. Uh, to read the story yourself, if you don't have a Nature Microbiology um, subscription, you can find the Nature Microbiology Twitter account. They did share this in a read cube format, so that means that it's read only. You can't download the PowerPoint, um, but this is something that is accessible uh, specifically through their Twitter account. Hey, Julie, we do have one question in the chat. Great. This it says, is this PR1SE the naturally occurring counterpart to a phage mid 
You can check oh. the chat if I'm not saying that right. Yeah, no, no, that's that's the right way to say that, Phageman. Um, it could be very similar to that. That's not actually something that um, I recall being addressed in the discussion, but uh, it's very astute uh, in that, yes, it could be similar to um, a phage mid, which is somewhat of a, a hybrid between a plasmid and a phage within bacteria. So it could be the archaeal counterpart to that. Um, good question, and thanks for, thanks for asking. OK, we're moving on to a publication from Environmental Science and Technology. This is a publication from the American Chemical Society. And this is titled, Fish meal application induces antibiotic resistance gene propagation in mariculture sediment. And the take home message from this is that fish meal contains and increases the number of antimicrobial resistance genes. So antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance genes are genes that confer resistance to certain drugs and they can enter into mariculture um, through practices such as um, those used in fish farms where the fish could be given um, some sort of antibiotic as their um, growth, um, uh, as part of their growth protocol. And these antibiotics, when they are given to the fish in the water, can persist both within the water, but especially in the marine sediment, so in the, the ground that is underneath the water. And they can persist in that sediment even after the antibiotic has been um, taken away if, if, and stopped giving, being given to those fish. And in fact, um, with the transfer of sediments um, in certain gradients, you can even find antibiotic resistant genes in the sediment of some fish farms that have never used antibiotics in their farming practices. And so some of these fish are going to end up in the food chain, in the human food chain served at restaurants, but some of them are low value fish that are not necessarily things that people want to buy at the market. And those fish are often turned into fish meal, as well as the byproducts, uh, like the carcasses of fish after they've been processed, um, can be turned into fish meal. Uh, and that occurs by steaming, drying, rendering, and then packaging these fish uh, that may have been exposed to the bacteria with antibiotic resistance genes. And this fish meal is treated globally. It's used in a variety of different purposes, both in feeding, feeding other fish um, in mariculture, in feeding animals, um, in livestock, uh, it's used in inland um, aquaculture production and can even be used um, as organic fertilizer, thus exposing plants to some of these antibiotic resistance genes. And so the authors of this paper wanted to explore what the um, resistome or what types of antibiotic resistance genes were present in different types of fish meal products. Uh, and so they did this looking at a number of different characteristics of these fish meals um, starting with looking at just what antibiotics are present. And so they had five different fish meal samples from throughout the entire world. They had, I believe they had one from Peru, one from China, one from Russia, and, and two others. And looking for 23 different types of antibiotics, they found each sample had between six and 11 antibiotics when they used mass spec, uh, looking for the presence of these different drugs. Then when they looked further using molecular methods, uh, using high throughput uh, qPCR, they found that um, in total, in all of those five fish meal samples, there were 132 different antibiotic resistant genes um, and four different mobile genetic elements. Those are ways that the genes may be transferred, such as plasmids or transposons. The highest concentration um, in any of the samples was 95 unique different antibiotic resistance genes. I don't recall off the top of my head which one of those samples it was. Um, but the most common mechanisms of antibiotic resistance was either antibiotic deactivation, so something like a carbapenemase, which can cleave carbapenem, um, that would be a deactivation of that particular drug, so something along those lines, or efflux pumps which is a mechanism that bacteria will use to pump um, drug concentrations outside of their cell to the extracellular environment where they, the drug no longer has access to the target. Uh, and so those were over three quarters of the total detected resistance genes that they found. They then wanted to further ask, does applying this fish meal to um, a model of mariculture microcosm, so making a sediment and putting some marine water on top of it. If you add fish meal to that system, does that increase the copy number of antibiotic resistance genes? And so that data is what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here. Uh, with some untreated samples, 
um, shown with the U. And then they looked at two different doses that either had low dose, um, which was in the middle column set, or high dose of this fish meal that they added into these different microcosms. And they looked at, over time, the number of different antibiotic resistance genes that they were able to detect. And you can see that there was both a dose-dependent effect, because there are more genes found in that high-dose um, treated system, and also a time-dependent effect. So you can see that over time, the number of these genes um, and the diversity of them also increases over time. So this was something, this, this piece of information was shared both by people who know the science. Um, this is, a, I believe, someone who's familiar with aquaculture who said that fish meal, one of the most globally traded commodities, is, is a vehicle to promote antibiotic resistance gene dissemination, as well as by journalists. So Marin McKenna uh, writes a lot about the use of antibiotics within ag different agriculture systems. And she said that this study recalls the finding by uh, another microbiologist in 2012 who found that feather meal, which is very similar to fish meal, but composed of chicken carcasses instead of fish uh, from slaughter, contains antibiotic resistant bugs. So that study looked actually at the organisms instead of just at the genetic material from those organisms. Uh, and so this was um, shared, as I said, fairly widely. It was not publicized in any general um, news organizations that I could find, but there were some trade magazines, although not microbiology trade magazines that found this in this article interesting. So New Food Magazine asked the question in their article, is fish meal to blame for rise in antibiotic resistance? To which I would say the answer is probably yes, but so are lots of other things since the rise in antibiotic resistance is a multifactorial problem, one that is compounded by not only the use of this fish meal and the feather meal, but also the, the practice of using antibiotics in agriculture as prophylaxis, um, the, the way that it's used as a growth promoter, in addition to all the ways that humans are using it in the clinic that are not necessarily um, appropriate, as we'll get into in the next uh, article. This was also um, an article of interest to the IFFO. This is the International Fish Meal and Fish Oil Organization, and they were uh, not very pleased with this article, so they wrote um, several rebuttals to the science itself, and th they were um, relatively um, correct, I would say, or at least uh, their arguments hold some water. So there are only five samples that were looked at here, um, and the, as such, they said that this is not something that has been uh, as critical as, as critically um, analyzed as it ought to be. But of course, we have to keep in mind that the IFFO has a vested interest in the answer to this question being no. Uh, and so they may be critical with uh, an eye on their fish meal continuing to be something that is globally traded. All right. So as I said, we're going to continue talking about antibiotic resistance. And the next um, report is one that was released from the insurance agency Blue Cross Blue Shield. And the title of this report is Antibiotic Prescription Fill Rates Declining in the U.S., with the take-home message pretty much being the title, the U.S. Antibiotic Prescription Fill Rates Are Declining. So this was published late last month um, in August 2017 um, as after a study that was performed by um, BCBS. So we, we know um, here on Microbial Minutes that antibiotic resistance use uh, antibiotics resistance is a big problem in the clinic. Uh, and it's driven by a number of things, right? It's driven by the use of that fish meal, and it's uh, driven by the overuse of antibiotics within the clinic. Uh, and one report that had been released, I believe it was part of a Pew study in May 2016, reported that around a third of antibiotic prescriptions in the U.S. are unnecessary. So that means that it's, uh, the, for example, a case where uh, someone comes in with a viral infection and receives antibiotics, which will not make that person heal any faster. It will not treat that infection, but that patient may leave feeling like they've received better service than if they hadn't received an, a prescription, which is part of the reason why a lot of healthcare professionals will end up giving prescriptions, even if they know that it won't necessarily help the patient. Uh, to fight this, there have been stewardship and education campaigns, both for the clinicians as well as for the public to let people know that 
it's very important to save these antibiotics for infections that they are needed for and not just for the case that you should take a pill if you feel sick. And so Blue Cross Blue Shield looked at antibiotic prescription fill rates by their insured members between the years 2010 and 2016 after outpatient visits, um, taking into account the prescriptions that they filled after the visits and no drugs that they were given during that visit. I should also say that this prescription fill rate could be a little nebulous in its terminology. This isn't the number of prescriptions that are filled per prescriptions given. It's just the number of prescriptions filled per uh, members of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, so it's important that we know the rate of what here. Uh, and as you can see, there, there are a number of really lovely infographics and data visualization um, patterns here that I think are, are really nicely displayed um, and you can see them picked up um, every, like on social media and a number of different mainstream news articles. Uh, you can see the results are very clear that there is a decrease in almost all types of antibiotics. The strongest decrease being in broad spectrum antibiotics, which is good because broad spectrum antibiotics treat many different types of bacteria. They are likely to treat the bacteria causing an infection, but they could also have an effect on other bystander bacteria and potentially expose those bystander bacteria to antibiotics that they may then become um, selected for resistance. So the, the fewer types of you know, bacteria that a drug works on, the better generally, because you're less likely to select for that bystander resistance effect. Um, Intermediate and narrow spectrum were also all down in the um, rate of their prescription. You can see there was a very sharp increase, 30% in the reserved spectrum. And those are drugs that are, those that are saved only for cases where no other drugs will work. Uh, and we'll talk about those in the next um, report. But this, this uh, is probably going up because the rate of resistance within the clinic is increasing. You can also see that there's regionality of where these prescription fill rates are um, higher and lower. So higher here is in brown, and you can see that uh, the south and the southwest here have the highest concentration of um, antibiotic prescriptions being filled, whereas the Pacific Northwest um, seem, and uh, Montana, uh, Idaho, these seem to be the areas where there's the lowest uh, number of prescriptions per 100 members. Um, so the, there's a lot of different, um, as I said, conclusions that you can make. Um, but the, a, overall, it, the conclusion that they made was that the fill rate of outpatient antibiotic um, prescriptions declined 9%. Uh, there were, uh, in addition to regional differences, there were differences in age groups. So 22% decline in infants, 16% decline in children, and 6% decline in adults. This may reflect the large number of inappropriate uh, prescriptions that were given to infants and children in particular, so it's easier to have a large decline when you're when there's more excess to get rid of, um, and uh, further declines are still warranted. So this was a study that was um, shared broadly in major news outlets. The Washington Post um, had an article where they interviewed Trent Haywood, the chief medical officer for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, who said in a statement that the study suggests public health efforts to reduce inappropriate use appear to be achieving measurable results, particularly in misuse of broad spectrum antibiotics. But he said there are further improvements to be made. And so this is also broadly shared, of course, Blue Cross Blue Shield wants everybody to know the good news. Um, Twitter users were saying, hey, we're doing something right. Lower antibiotic prescription rates means progress against creating more resistant bacteria. And this is great. It's good to celebrate your wins. However, it's also important not to uh, start to feel too um, overconfident and to continue some of these measures. What this is uh, should really act as is positive reinforcement for a lot of these stewardship campaigns that hospitals and education centers have been having. Uh, and so it's important to use this as a stepping stone and not like, oh, look, we are, we are there, but more like we are on the way there. And so... Um, Speaking of antibiotic resistance, we will now talk about an article from the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, which is titled, Colistin and Poly Polymixin B Susceptibility Testing for Carbapenem Resistant and MCR Positive Enterobacteriaceae, Comparison of Sensitizer, 
Microscan, Vitec 2, and E-Test with broth microdilution. Uh, and so the take-home message uh, from this study is that there's difficulty in predicting polymyxin susceptibility, particularly using these commercial tests that um, the scientists here are using. So colistin and polymyxin B are antibiotics of last resort. So they're in that reserved spectrum um, for, especially for things like multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria like the carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. Um, and so uh, determining now that these drugs are uh, increasing in their use and the, the types of resistant infection that require this last line uh, of antibiotic are now necessary, it's important for clinical microbiologists to be able to determine whether an isolate is susceptible or resistant to these polymyxins. Um, and colistin and polymyxin B are very similar compounds. I think they differ in a single amino acid, um, if I recall correctly. <clears throat> so they want to, this scientific group wants to test the commercial, different commercial testing methods and compare those to um, the current standard, which is broth microdilution without polysorbate 80 supplementation. So broth microdilution is very commonly used in order to determine susceptibility um, and MICs. You take different, um, and MIC is minimum inhibitory concentration. You take um, several different tubes that have media with um, stepwise decreases in the amount of drug that each of those tubes contain. Uh, and you inoculate and see where is the, the um, highest concentration or the lowest concentration to either inhibit or allow growth uh, of that particular microbe. And so that's a very labor intensive um, test and it takes a lot of time. And so the, the authors wanted to test whether either Sensititer, which is a commercial broth microdilution system, or Vitec2 or Microscan, which are automated um, antibiotic susceptibility test systems, or whether e-test, which is uh, a gradient um, diffusion method where um, one piece of paper is impregnated with different concentrations of drug, and that is put onto a lawn of bacteria, whether any of these particular um, systems would be more effective, uh, or at least as good as the current standard of broth microdilution. And so the results were, oh, I'm sorry, uh, to test this, we should probably go over what they actually tested. They looked at 76 different isolates of Enterobacteriaceae. So these are things like uh, E. coli, Klebsiella, things that you often hear about um, uh, with resistance issues. And 21 of these uh, different isolates had an MCR1 colistin resistance as well. Uh, and so what they're looking at here uh, are, oops, are the number of isolates that were susceptible here and the number of isolates that were resistant. Um, and they're going to compare the results that they get for these different methods to that which they get with broth mi microdilution. And then comparing that to the broth microdilution, they're going to look at some characteristics such as the isolates that are um, that have either essential agreement or categorical agreement. Um, and these are different FDA terms in, in assessing um, uh, assessing different um, methods. Uh, and you'll see here that um, there's pretty good agreement. We've got 93, 89% um, essential agreement, 88, 90% with this Vitec2 and the Sensititer um, looking at uh, the categorical agreement. Um, now, the E test was quite a bit worse. It was only 75% agreement with that broth microdilution. And so that's only uh, three quarters of the isolates that were in agreement. Uh, but in addition to looking at these agreement numbers, they also wanted to look at the um, VME, which is the very, oh, what does M stand for? V something error rate. This is a, these are two types of error rate. Um, and you can see the acceptable rate for FDA to approve a test is 1.5%. So here they're looking at how many of the isolates isolates um, exhibit this um, error rate. And although the Vitec 2 had relatively high agreement rates, it also had a very high uh, VME, 36%. Um, and in fact, all of these error rates were above that 1.5% that the FDA um, uh, uses as its standard. Uh, and the authors argue that this may be due in part to the small number of isolates that they're studying um, which is true, uh, and they conclude that the sensitizer 
seems generally reliable for polymyxin B and colistin, but does overcall resistance. So it calls something resistant more often than it is. Whereas the Vitec 2 has um, an unacceptably high false susceptibility rate, um, with saying that something is susceptible when in truth it is resistant, um, particularly with colistin, as you can see here. Uh, so this was something that was not very broadly um, picked up by the media. This is a very technical um, uh, report, but it's important because uh, it is necessary for clinical microbiologists to be able to determine susceptibility of isolates before telling healthcare providers how to treat an infection. And this is uh, something that clinical microbiologists are discussing quite a lot. This was shared on social media, um, widely shared from the Journal of Clinical Microbiology um, Twitter handle, as well as uh, by other clinical microbiologists uh, as well. And it was also a topic of one of the Bugs and Drugs blog posts all the way back in May of this year. So this has been an ongoing problem, how to test for colistin resistance. Uh, and so if you're interested in reading more, we'll put a link to that blog um, by Romney Humphreys, who is an antimicrobial susceptibility testing expert and discusses what her lab experience is from a first um, point of, from her point of view. Uh, okay, and so we're going to end today by talking about a paper from Science that um, was also really neat and probably uh, made it onto your radar because this was something that broke into mainstream news. This was titled Seasonal Cycling in the Gut Microbiome of the Hadza Hunter-Gatherers of Tanzania. So from here, the take-home message is that microbiomes has a se have a seasonality in a hunter-gatherer population. Uh, this is something um, the seasonality is new, but studies of the Hadza microbiome is not new. There was a study, I don't believe in 2014, on the diversity of the gut microbiome, comparing the Hadza people, which are hunter-gatherer people, to um, a group of Italians who were stand-ins uh, for those with a Western diet, showing that there was a greater diversity in the hunter-gatherer population within the number uh, and um, types of um, bacteria that were found within the, those microbiomes. So the Hadza are uh, a hunter-gatherer people from that, um, as it says in the title, are from Tanzania, and they live in an environment that has two distinct seasons. Um, the wet season is from November to April, and the dry season is from May to October. And during these different seasons, their eating habits change quite a bit. During the wet season, things are growing, flowers are blooming, the bees are uh, turning some of that nectar into honey, uh, and then the, some of those flowers will eventually turn into berries, so berry foraging increases. And during the dry season, hunting is more successful, uh, and so there's more meat inside of the diet of these people. Uh, however, there are some things that are year-round consistent, and those are things like tubers and baobab and fiber-rich types of um, carbohydrates that are eaten year-round. And so with the researchers here wanted to look at was not only the Hadza microbiome at one single time point, but how does it change over this annual cycle of wet and dry, um, especially in respect to the diets that are uh, due to this wet and dry cycle. So we're going to talk about two different figures from this paper. The first is up here on the left-hand side, where they use, um, they, they take different 16S rRNA genes sequences and look at the similarity using um, PCA. So this is basically looking at the similarity within the samples and see that there are two distinct groups. You can see here in the purple, this is the wet season. And here in the green, either olive green or light green, depending on whether it was um, one year or the subsequent year, that is the dry season. And you can see that those dry seasons, like the microbiomes overlap almost perfectly um, compared to the wet season where there might be a little bit of overlap in this area here, but more or less the, you can see the distinction between these two different microbiomes. They also compared these different microbiomes to that of um, the human microbiome project. So these are people who are largely on Western diets again. So that means people who are eating a lot of refined sugars, more processed food, meat is available all year round. People are pretty omnivorous. Uh, and you can see that between these two groups, uh, we are now able to, to see three distinct populations of microbiomes. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see that the uh, here the wet season, 
and the dry season with a little bit of overlap. They're, they're refining this a little bit more by looking at early and late wet dry season. So there's going to be a little transitional period, of course, but that those are both very distinct from the human microbiome project, which is found over here and this, those microbiomes of the Western diet um, people. They also looked and saw seasonality within the Hadza of Bacteroidetes and the firmicu Firmicutes um, that increased and decreased over time. So they, they were able to see um, these Bacteroidetes in particular are um, important for eating or digesting a lot of those complex carbohydrates. Uh, they further, in, in addition to simply saying, yes, the microbiomes are different, went on and characterized some of the functionality of these different microbiome members. Uh, and they found um, that the wet season has a microbiota, so that would be in purple, has fewer cadzymes. These are cadzymes. These are um, plant, animal, and mucin carbohydrate active enzymes compared to the dry season microbiota. So in all um, different carbohydrate classes, those from animals, those from plants, and those from mucins, that would be like the mucus that lines the, the gut, can see that there are fewer um, enzymes that can digest those different carbohydrates in the dry season relative to the wet seasons. Uh, and this is probably indicative, they say, of the different um, foods that the people are eating and therefore giving their, their gut microbiome and selecting for different populations of bacteria to grow. Also, interestingly, those cazymes differ quite a bit from uh, those who are in the human, those subjects from the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, and in particular, the scientists point out the very high number of cazymes of mucin ut utilization here in the, those with a Western diet, suggesting that this may have some sort of interplay with um, inflammatory disease. So those, uh, if you are not eating um, a lot of different types of complex carbohydrates, then uh, this may turn on or uh, allow the bacteria to start to degrade the mucin and potentially cause inflammation within the, the gastrointestinal tract. Just um, speculation that the authors say based on this result here. Uh, you can also see the number of antibiotic resistance genes change uh, both seasonally within the Hadza uh, and all, all of these uh, number of antibiotic resistance genes are lower than those the number that is found in uh, the Western the people with the Western diet. Probably unsurprising to uh, most of you who are listening. Finally, um, the authors conclude that our data show that in Hadza individuals living a traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle, the gut microbiota follow a cyclical, succession of species that correspond with enrichment of seasonally associated functions. A lot of this is probably not too surprising to people who are listening. We've known for some time that if you change your diet within a day or two, you'll start to see changes within the microbiome constituents. Um, however, some of the things that they found were uh, things that included um, large numbers of bacterial types and species that are not found in Western diets. And so that was that was something that uh, the researchers thought they might be able to follow up and see whether the Western diet has selected for the growth of microbial species that were either a minority of the microbiome population or perhaps not even present within the hunter-gatherer population. So as you can see, this study was pretty widely shared. This thing was found in the New York Times. It was highlighted by Nature Research Highlights. Um, uh, in the New York Times, they were able to speak with one of the lead scientists. Um, uh, here, an excerpt says, the families of bacterial species that swing most strongly over a year in the Hadza gut are extremely rare in developed countries. Researchers have no idea why. That's a huge question. It's the elephant in the room, Dr. Schnorr said, and I believe Dr. Schnorr was the uh, first or second author. The Hadza may offer clues about what the microbiome was like in other societies before diets were transformed by modern agriculture and industry. And so this um, was widely shared by people who are microbial scientists, but this was also widely shared by people who are not um, microbial scientists. So this, um, John, uh, this, this user I am not familiar with, but he is not, um, in his Twitter bio, does not claim any knowledge of microbiology, however, is um, a holistic medicine practicer. And so uh, here, what his summary of the study is, is that Stanford study backs seasonal eating for the healthiest microbiome. And here, a medical doctor um, also says, does your microbiome change with the season? It should. Your gut microbes change with a seasonal local diet. 
Uh, and I think that both of these put judgment onto the data in a way that is not necessarily stated by the researchers. Um, so what they're showing is that the difference in microbiome, change, there's a difference between those who are in using a Western diet and having a hunter-gatherer diet, and that those with the hunter-gatherer diet have a seasonality, as one might expect, as different input uh, via food sources changes over time. But neither of those call it a quote-unquote healthy microbiome, uh, since I, a healthy microbiome is something that remains undefined in this relatively new field of microbiology. And in fact, if you click on this newscientist.com article, you'll see that the title is Eat a Seasonal Diet and Your Gut Microbes May Change in Sync. Uh, so that's much closer to a summary of what the researchers found rather than saying, be healthier by having a seasonal diet and your gut microbes will change in sync. Um, and so I just wanted to point this out as uh, yet another way that science can be put out and the data can be um, relayed uh, and yet picked up and um, given a particular spin that may or may not be the original intent. Uh, in fact, this new scientist article was quite interesting. It spoke with one of the other lead scientists um, of, the, of the study, and he is a big fan of the Hadza microbiome um, population or the, the, the Hadza and the, the studies of their microbiome because they're a very unique population. There's only around 1,300 uh, members of the Hadza who are practicing this hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and he has tried eating um, in the same type of way that the Hadza have, and he has even given himself a fecal microbiota transplant in order to see whether or not he can hold on to any of those bacteria that were not previously found in his own gut microbiome. Um, so those are all unpublished and anecdotal evidence, but uh, I thought it was very uh, indicative of his uh, enthusiasm for the subject. All right, so that's going to close out our um, microbial mon um, minutes for today. Uh, we, today we've discussed how archaeal vesicles mediate virus-like plasmid transfer. We discussed fish meal um, and how it contains and increases the number of antimicrobial uh, resistance genes. We discussed the U.S. antibiotic prescription fill rate and how it is declining um, due in part to stewardship and education campaigns. We talked about the difficulty in predicting polymyxin susceptibility and how that's an issue with some of these um, antibiotics of last resort. Uh, and finally, we spoke about how microbiomes have seasonality in a hunter-gatherer population. With that, uh, thanks for listening. And our next Microbial Minute will be in October, um, I think October 2nd. So in another three weeks, hopefully there will be um, similarly a lot of really cool microbiology science to talk about. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you then. Have a great week, everyone.